us this morning with thanksgiving for the day. Thank you, Father, for your mercy, your grace, your kindness, and your love, and for bringing us together again, Lord, on this side of eternity, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, bless this service with your presence. Guide us with your spirit, the Lord, and your word. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand together and turn to page 339, singing Standing on the Promises. I can't someone's hand this morning. I'm glad to see you in the house of the Lord. <laughs>
each one of you here this morning, and uh, ask Joe to come and bring the message today. Have a little change here in this pulpit. Come on. Have your Bibles. Let's turn to John chapter eight. John chapter eight. Appreciate the opportunity to get to preach today. It's not anything that I can think of or off the top of my head that I enjoy doing more than preaching. <clears throat> and so I appreciate the opportunity. We're going to look beginning in John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. That's important, they were believers. If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is, servant, is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, let's give thanks for the reading of the word. We give thanks for the precious word of God and the privilege it is to be able to have a copy of it. Lord, and indeed many copies in some cases. Lord, we're just grateful for the word and we're thankful for it because... It's only by continuing in the word that we can be free from any bondage that we are under. And I just pray, Father, that the Spirit will would open our eyes to receive a word from above today. Fill my mouth with thy words and, Lord, help us to enter into the presence of God through the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I can title the message today, Be Freedom We Celebrate. Freedom We Celebrate. This week, this is the last weekend before the 4th of July, and uh, I imagine all of the, the vendors who are selling fireworks right now are, are probably pretty stoked about this weekend because this will be the last big weekend when people will be purchasing fireworks. And I'm sure on the 4th, and uh, Dana was telling me that it's is going to be on the 5th this year on the lake, and so... Um, I would imagine this week there will be more fireworks. There probably, probably if we could tally up the total dollar spent on fireworks this week, we could probably take a huge chunk out of the national federal or federal government's debt and uh, resolve some of that. But we Americans like to celebrate our nation. We observe with fireworks, which is really just a symbol of our nation's war over independence to be able to live in a country where we're free and can worship God in a way that we choose. And we sometimes I think we forget that that's the whole purpose of what the, free, the, the war that was fought over freedom is so that we could choose how we worship God. Amen. That's the whole reason that the country was founded to begin with. And it gave us independence over the English crown so that we could worship, worship God as a nation freely as we see fit. Now growing up in Tulsa, we lived, we lived in, um, well from the time I came home from the hospital, until I was 12 years old, we lived across the street from the iconic Admiral Twin Drive-In. Y'all probably may have heard of the Admiral Twin Drive-In. We lived right across the street from it, and I remember a few days prior to 4th of July, leading up to the 4th of July, before the show started, they would always have a pretty big fireworks display, and I remember sitting out in the front yard watching it, and I remember it being so big I mean, you could, I remember leaning back and not being able to take in the full boom of every one of the fireworks that went off. And it was a pretty big display of fireworks. And we enjoyed the 4th of July and the festivities that, that went on during that time. And what, I guess even if I didn't understand completely what it meant to be doing that, I am very thankful for the country that we live in and the freedoms that we have. Truly, God has blessed our nation from the dawn of its creation, and we have been founded upon uh, and held to the unmovable principles of Scripture. Amen. We need to worship God in a way that our conscience dictates. <clears throat> our, our nation's adherence to the Word of God is open 
a channel for God's saving grace to extend to an entire lost and dying world. The emphasis of God's redeeming plan before the foundation of the world has been one process, and that's bringing freedom through salvation to lost and dying souls. Jesus in this passage today in John chapter 8 tells us that if we will continue in the word of God, that we will know the truth. This word is Christ in print form. The scripture tells us the word became flesh and dwelt among us and then when he left. The spirit of the Lord came and, and when the fullness of time came, delivered to us the word of God in print without error. Don't let anybody ever tell you that there's error in the Word of God. If you think foolishly that there's an error in the Word of God, you might want to check your own salvation. There are no errors in the Word of God. God has divinely placed his hand on this text. It's a sacred text and delivered it to us so that if we'll continue in the Word, we have any bondages in our life, we'll know the truth by reading the word, and this truth shall make us free. Truth is the key, and freedom is the goal. Amen. It always has been, Amen. even before the foundations of the world. Today I want us to look at three examples out of scripture of pictures of freedom. I want us to begin in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. These are just little vignettes I want us to look at and glean a little bit from, and I won't keep you very long. Wink, wink. <laughs> Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 35, it came to pass as he was coming nigh into Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I, might, uh, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. This man near Jericho was a beggar. He didn't have any means. He didn't have any substance. He begged for a living. And he could not see anything. Now he had a voice, he had ears that he could hear, but he couldn't see anything. And when he heard the multitude, he wanted to know what it was about. What's going on? He asked those around him. And they said, well, Jesus of Nazareth had passed by. Him. Apparently the man had heard of Jesus and knew what Jesus was capable of. And so he didn't ask, he didn't say, would you run up there and ask him? No, no, no. He started crying out. He started yelling, Jesus of Nazareth, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And he cried because the man was powerless to get to Jesus. He couldn't see anything. But because of his faith, he received the freedom to see. The freedom to look. Now I want us to look at another man. In John chapter 5, verse 2. John chapter 5, verse 2. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, the blind halt wither, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. 
And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been there now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man say, answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. This particular man had a bondage in that he was stuck. He was stuck. Like Chuck, for 38 years and could not move. 38 years is a long time to just be sitting there. And knowing, he knew, I won't sit here, but there is no way I can get in the water. The, there were rules to the pool. Have you ever been to a pool where they have rules? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No running. Yeah. No diving in the shallow end. There's rules at the pool. Don't bring glass bottles. You know what I mean? There are rules for this pool. And only when the water is troubled, the first one that gets there gets the heat. Rules. And see, just like this man, we too are under the bondage of the law of sin. This man was bound to his little stuck place by the law of the pool. The law of the pool said, unless you can get there when the water's troubled, you're beat. And for 38 years, he was beat. He could hear, he could see, he could speak, but his infirmity made him powerless to get to the pool. But Jesus saw him and had compassion. Jesus gave him a healing command. Rise and walk. And you know what? Unless this guy just was, I don't know, he, he could have been disobedient. He said, you know what? I believe I think I'm just going to sit here for about another 38 years. But he didn't do that. He got up. He was obedient. He got up. And walked. He found freedom in a command. <coughs> Let's look at one other guy. Let's look at Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Begin with verse 1. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper. And worshiped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. <clears throat> Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. See, the bondage that this man had made him an outcast. See, he couldn't, he could see, he could hear, he could speak, he could walk, all of that, but his uncleanness made him powerless to socialize in his community and ultimately made it impossible for him to go home to whatever family he might have had. But when he came to Jesus, humbled himself, worshiped the Lord, confessing his faith in the Lord's power, he said, If thou wilt, thou can heal me. And Jesus said, I will be healed. Instantly, the Lord's graciousness granted him freedom to go home to his family. That's right. That's right. To attend services at the church house. Right. And to socialize openly in his community. I can't even imagine what that must be like to know you're a leper got rotten flesh, your garments are all unclean, you can't go out and see people. 
Now, some folks will say, you know what, that sounds kind of like a cool deal. I don't, like, I don't really much care for people. I kind of like to just stay home and not have to deal with them. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let somebody give you a diagnosis that you have to stay home. You have to stay home. You can't go anywhere. You can't see people. You can't do anything. I think that would make a big difference. Wouldn't it? Each of these three people had an encounter with the person of the truth. Jesus, the living word of God. And their faith brought them a glorious freedom. These are the pictures and stories of us, you and I. Oh, they're, they're historic pictures of people Jesus touched, but they're our stories. See, underneath the physical affliction of being unable to see, the blind man had no, no capacity to behold and observe the Creator and Maker of heaven and earth. What would that be like to live at a time when Jesus was actually there? He was moving around in the crowds, multitudes following him. And you knew who he was, you know what he could do. But you couldn't place your eyes on him. You couldn't see him. You couldn't behold the one who spoke all of creation into order. And see, his eyes were open. Can you imagine the first thing this guy saw? It was the face of Jesus. The face of the one who made him to begin with. And all the beauty that he, I'm sure, beheld when his eyes opened up. He got to see first the master. <clears throat> when Jesus healed him, Christ's face was the first that he beheld. And then the infirm man's issues underneath his physical affliction of being stuck and being unable to move to a place of healing. The most devastating part is he had no ability to heal himself. He couldn't speak a word to himself and make himself rise up and walk. No more that whenever we get some kind of vicious illness like COVID or, I don't know, getting some kind of terrible, have some operation that make it debilitate you. We don't have the ability to just speak and say, now there's some word of faith folks that'll tell you, well, you just speak. Well, don't say something negative. Don't speak that into existence like you have some kind of power to speak something into existence. You don't. There's only one that does. Jesus himself, Jesus Christ, the word of God and his father, God. These are the only ones that can speak something into existence. And this poor impotent guy that was there in, in, on the pool of Bethesda, he had no power to speak over his own life and body to get up. And walk. When Jesus came to him, it was the first time he was able to see that the law of the stirring water could be bypassed by a living Savior. That's right. That's right. He didn't have to abide by a law when Jesus came by. He wasn't bound to a law of sin that kept him afflicted and unable to move. Jesus bypassed that law. He bypassed the law and he spoke a word. And after, can you imagine laying there 38 years and with a word, he was able to get up and walk. Hey, let me tell you, I don't know how old this dude was, but I can't imagine him just casually getting up and walking out of that place. I would imagine he was probably bounding over things and jumping and leaping why do you say that? Well, it was the Sabbath day, and he made quite an uproar because they wanted to know who told him to rise up and take his bed and walk. Amen. You read that, I encourage you to read that in your quiet time because a full-scale investigation proceeded oh, yeah. after this guy got his word of healing. Then there's the leper. See, underneath the physical affliction of his diseased flesh, which made him 
an outcast, banished from everybody, was not only unable to heal himself, but he was unable to cleanse his flesh in the uncleanness of his own garments. There wasn't a thing he could do to fix it. And probably the worst of all, he was ostracized from the fellowship. Ostracized from the fellowship. You know, I think there are probably people out in the world who won't come and darken the door of the house of God because they don't feel like that they're worthy to come in. Well, you know, there's a truth to that. Because when we come in those doors back there, we come into a holy place. You know what? Not everybody can just walk into a holy way. Now, I guess there are some people who are probably arrogant enough to just think, I go wherever I want to go. This is America. I'm going to land of the free. I'm going to pray. And they just come on in. <clears throat> Camp down. When we come through those back doors back there, we come into a holy place where we meet with God Almighty. And this poor guy, who is a leper, He had been ostracized from the fellowship. And he couldn't come in. And I happen to think, too, you know, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And I believe that. And I don't think Anthony Fossey was the first person who instituted social distancing. You know, I, there were people in the Bible who had leprosy. Naaman didn't have a problem coming with his group and, and seeing the man of God. And this man didn't, ha didn't have an issue coming and seeing Jesus, I'm sure there was a modicum of social distancing involved. So COVID was not the first time, I don't think, that social distancing was practiced. When he came to Jesus, he made a statement. If you will, you can do this. I know you can. You still can. Be clean. And just like that, just like that, a word was spoken and he was clean. He was made clean. These pictures are pictures of us. We were blind. But when we got a hold of the truth, then we could see. We were unable to come to a Christ who could speak a word and change our life. Us. He saw us in our poor, helpless condition. He spoke a word. We were able to overcome the law of sin and come into his presence and be healed. And finally, we were no longer ostracized. We were no longer pushed out of the fellowship. Jesus reached down to the old filthy leper and touched him and he welcomed him home. Told him to go see the priest and make sure you do all the right stuff and gave him his freedom. So this week when we celebrate the freedom of our country will you remember the freedom you were given in Christ? What did he free you from? Oh, I know what he freed me from. We ain't got enough time to talk about that. I know where I came from, and I know what he saved me from. I know the bondages. I didn't say bondage. Bondages that I was involved in. And over time, one by one, he spoke a word to me. He delivered a book to my hand, the word of God that I could read. And I could know the truth and be set free. When, when we set up those firecrackers and those booms are going off on the lake or wherever you're going to go to celebrate, will you remember the boom that happened in your life when Jesus moved in? He spoke a word to you and he made you free. He gave you your freedom. And I don't know about you, maybe you don't realize, or maybe you haven't caught the vision yet, maybe you have that there's an entire world moving around you.
walking around you that's in bondage. They're living in a, in a bondage of sin that we can't see. But we are the hands, the feet, and the mouth of Christ. And some of these folks are just waiting for a word. Now, you can't speak anything to existence. See, they have to get to know the truth. But just a word can open the door to deliver the truth to their hands. Have you caught the vision that there are folks who need you to speak a word to them? You know, so I want you to read that scripture with me. Go with me to Psalm chapter 40. This will be our last passage today. Psalm chapter 40. I love Psalms. There's a lot to be gleaned out of Psalms. But this particular one is an interesting song. <clears throat> chapter, uh, chapter 40, verse 3. Psalmist David writes, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. I want you to think about songs. Usually whenever I'm in the car and I've got a song playing, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing the song, I'm listening to the song. I'm hearing the song. I believe that our life is a song. It's the song of the Savior. The song of one who has delivered us from bondage. One that doesn't necessarily get listened to but rather one that is observed and seen. What kind of a song are you singing that other people can see it and it causes them to fear? Fear. Not be afraid of you, but fear. Well, what would they be afraid of? Fearful maybe that they would be lost on their way to hell. Why? Because that next phrase says they, they will see it in fear and then trust in the Lord. This week when you're celebrating the freedom we have in this great country, what will you be remembering that Christ saved you from? And will it be something that will flow out of you that the next person next to you can see? That, that, that person, let me tell you something about my dad. I don't care where we go to, wherever we go together, Everybody can they they spot who Dad is. That 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 he's just he has a song that flows out of him that not only do people see total strangers are attracted to him, and Dad often asks them if they go to church somewhere if they're saved. I mean, he's pretty bold. Because his, his song is pretty strong. It flows from him. And the genuine care he has for other people. Do we have that? Does our, does our life sing that? Does our life song come out of us that it attracts people because they can see Christ in us? When we celebrate this week, I hope you think about the bondage you've been set free from and the freedom you've been given. I hope you think about the song that's flowing out of you because we don't have much time left and people need to know about the Christ that lives inside of us. And hopefully we can draw a few people in before it's too late. Finally, is your heart filled with gratitude for the freedom you have? Do you have gratitude in your heart for the freedom you have in Christ? I think a lot of people are pretty dissatisfied in how their life's going. They're disgruntled, they're dissatisfied, for whatever reason. And in the grand scheme of things, I believe people who are dissatisfied in their life are people who are ungrateful. Do you hear me? They're ungrateful. If God never gives you another blessing beyond the day he saved your wretched soul from hell, you ought to be grateful. That's right. Amen. That's right. 
He doesn't do one more thing for you. You need to be grateful. God not only can speak a word and fix us, he's also a great mechanic. We get out of tune, but he gets tuned up. So today, as we get ready to close, ask Miss Robin to come to the piano. <clears throat> I'm going to ask if you need a tune-up before we go into the week of celebration of the freedom of our nation and maybe the freedom that you have in Christ. Maybe you have some sort of bondage in your life that you've not confessed and you've not surrendered to the Lord and you need him to speak a word of freedom in your life. He'll do it. I'm not saying that, that necessarily you'll be like one of these folks in the Bible. Is they got a word and instantly they were just. Some people's bondages today are so deep and so intense it takes it takes time to unravel from them. But God can do it. He can speak a word. If you need to do business today with the Lord, we're going to open up the altars. I ask you to come and do business as we look at a week towards celebrating. Of knowing the truth and the truth giving us freedom. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the privilege to spend to open up the Word and to read and to hear stories about people who are given freedom, given a new lease on life because a Savior was able to look at them, go to them in, in pity and in compassion and show mercy. Lord, we just give thanks right now for that same compassion and mercy and pity that we were shown to receive a glorious freedom. Lord, if there's anyone here who's struggling, Lord, who just needs to rededicate and be reminded that our life is a song that people need to be able to see, not necessarily hear. Lord, draw people so that we can give a word and point them to the truth that's able to make them free. Lord, just move about today in our midst, and we give thanks for the faithful that are here, Lord. And if there's any needs in the, in the, uh, in the uh, sanctuary today, I pray, Father, that those needs would be met. And we pray these things in Christ Jesus' name for his sake.